the more um, generous I became, I started feeling internal peace and joy. And that kind of strengthened my faith that there definitely is truth to the fact that happiness lies within, lies in these emotions, lies in these virtues. And obviously the, the body is not the one having these virtues. The body is not the one who, you know, who, who basically, uh, like it's, if I ask you, are you intelligent, you say yes. So if I ask you, show me your capacity to know, are you going to be able to show it to me? So no, that's something you can't show someone. And that is the soul. The soul's primary virtue is the capacity to know and feel. And that's not something you can see with your eyes. It's just an, it is an experience. I mean, it's something you experience. So, I think all these things kind of stand in my faith that there is definitely something like the soul. And then as I learn more about the law of karma uh, and reincarnation, uh, I think it just stand in my faith. And then I totally, from within, I mean, at the experience level, I'm still not reached that level where I can experience that I'm different from the body. But at the intellectual level, I think I'm pretty convinced that I am separate from the body. And that the beauty of the body or the way the body looks is really not my beauty or the way I look. Uh, and things like that. You know, where necessary pampering the body is not a priority for me. Instead, focusing more towards spiritual growth is more of a priority. Because I know that when I die, I'm going to leave the body behind. The body is nothing but a very temporary vessel in which I decide, I being the soul, and I'd rather focus on my personal growth versus the growth of or the development of the body. Focused or connected to a certain type of 
energy is medication. Now most of the time, we are constantly focused on a lot of negative thoughts. Our mind is preoccupied by a lot of negativity. Whereas my brother said we are constantly finding faults in people, faults in situations, we are either consumed with our anger, anger ego, deceit, selfishness, violence. So any, uh, any negative energy which is basically circulating within us, any negative emotion, that is all negative plan. And that is also actually meditation which, are, which basically falls in the category of Ardhadhyan and Rogdhadhyan. You can go much deeper into understanding the Sushyans when I am not going to. And connecting to any form of positivity or positive emotions. And for that you don't necessarily need to be sitting in a corner with your eyes shut. But any act of compassion, where you are constantly being connected to the virtue of compassion, any act of kindness, any act of being humble or respectful, where you are connected to the positive emotion or positive energy of respect and compassion, that is dharma which is the positive meditation. So really, meditation is not necessarily sitting down in a corner with your eyes shut. It's basically something we do every moment of our life. And uh, being aware with what kind of energy you're connecting yourself with, whether it's some sort of negative emotion or positive emotion, that determines whether you are doing the negative kind of meditation or the positive kind of meditation. And that, according to Jainism, is truly meditation. And the life of a Jain monk, a Jain sadhu, is nothing but every second of their day, they are totally doing positive, meditating on positive things. Every action of theirs is nothing but an outcome of positive, concentrating on positivity or connecting with positive. Thing with me right now, uh, ego, as I mentioned, is one of the biggest parts or the biggest negative emotion that we can think of is our ego and is the ego. So I have this really beautiful uh, seven steps of for overcoming ego is bold on you, which I just quickly recite. I think it would be very helpful, and that's definitely one way in which you can connect to positivity. Mm-hmm. is number one, stop being offended. Number two, let go of your need to win. Number three, let go of your need to be right. I think especially important in couples. Uh, number four, let go of your need to be superior. Number five, let go of your need to have more. Number six, let go of identifying yourself on the basis of your achievements. And lastly, let go of your reputation. Reputation, you ask 30 different people, you have 30 different reputations. They are just stories in people's heads. So, I mean, these are seven steps that you can try to overcome the negativity of ego. I mean, other things we spoke about is being compassionate and being respectful, especially to your parents. I think that is a great and biggest step towards positivity. Letting go of your own selfish needs and being, being more accommodating to others is another big step towards positivity. And I think what my brother said, which is one of the biggest things and most easiest things if we make up our mind, which we all can do, is the biggest and best way to get rid of all negativities within you is to stop criticizing others. Uh, because by criticizing, and usually we do this, it's become such a habit in us. Something you, anything you can't say to someone's face, don't say it. Because by speaking negatively, you're inviting so much negative energy into your life and into you, that honestly peace and happiness is so far from you. This meditation, positive meditation is so far away from you if you're constantly complaining and criticizing about others. Uh, and I think this is, as my brother mentioned, maybe we can't control the thoughts in our head. We can't control the negative thoughts we have about people. But we can definitely control our speech. And I think this is something that we all should.
should implement starting now to ensure that I will never speak negatively of anyone. I don't think this is, huh? Uh, and I think this is a great way to bring more positivity into your life and to disconnect from negativity. Um, I realize that it's past seven, so uh, maybe if we take it for okay. one. I think they at a young age is still really, really remarkable, but when you're making a decision, you think about whether you put the condition, let me dedicate my life to maybe helping some just cause like helping animals who are in the silent industry and then they try to add a later age. No, you know, honestly, everyone's saying they take a at a later age, but who knows how long I'm going to live for, how many years I have left. And honestly, at a later age, when you're older, you have so many limitations, physical, mental, emotional. And you're so set in your ways that it's impossible to change at a later age, almost impossible to change at a later age. It's almost impossible to get your body accustomed to that kind of living at a later age. And once again, who knows, right? Who knows if that later age is really going to come? And I think taking Diksha, Diksha in itself is the biggest service towards all life. Because day to day you are not hurting even one living being. So here, maybe I might fight for animal rights and try to save animals, but still on a daily basis we are killing millions of lives, which at the soul level are no different from the soul in a cow, or no different from the soul in a human being, then how, how can I even justify me fighting so passionately about animals when I am still constantly and every day killing so much life? for my selfish needs. So honestly, Diksha is only a true and pure way to practice and insight and compassion because you are not given even one life for your own selfish needs. In fact, you are taking on so many physical hardships just so that you can ensure peace and fearlessness in all forms of life. And secondly, as I mentioned before, even if I do fight for animal rights or even if I do take care of the needy or work at an old age home, what I can give them at the most is only physical comforts, which are all very temporary. I cannot give them anything which they can take on for the, into their next life. And I cannot give them anything which they can use to truly rid themselves of the internal pain and negativity they have within them. Because honestly, all, the root of all pain and suffering is always inside. The, the, the sadhus and sadhvis who go through intense physical hardships they have no pain, they don't feel that those, those hardships don't give them pain because from within they are so fulfilled and at peace. So true happiness to give someone happiness truly means to give them internal happiness because external things are very fleeting, very temporary, can only give you like five seconds of happiness at the most. But after that you are back to where you are because we all are suffering from within. So by living the life of a monk or a Jain Sadhu, I am helping people to change from within, which I think is the root for of, of true happiness. You know, one of the things that I'm gathering from, from this group is there's a lot of interest and curiosity about what a Jain Disha is and what life post Disha actually will be. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to actually set up a blog for which I can, on behalf of my sister, at least as part of her diksha, and then maybe going forward, share some perspectives and thoughts, and hopefully give you guys more glimpses into what it is to be a Jain monk. And so if you may be interested in subscribing to this, you know, I think uh, Rajat has a Facebook group for this particular event. And I've posted on that group, so if you are interested, you know, my name is Usha you know my last name, just send me a quick message on Facebook if you'd, be, if you'd like to be part of that group where you can learn a little bit more about what the actual ceremony of Diksha is, but even more importantly, what the life of a Jain monk is post Diksha. But when he said on behalf of me, I, after Diksha, I am no way I'm supporting no, this page, right? <laughs> 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 because after the dancing, I have no Facebook or any of that. <laughs> 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 That's something easy to get off the subject. I have a question. I think we can start with a message. My name is Kimberly.
what do I want my future to be, and who am I. And just by who am I, the answer is not just I am a soul, but I am ask it means I am the virtues of the soul. I am forgiveness. I am contentment. That is my true nature because that is the true nature of the soul. I am humility. I am generosity. I am detachment. These, this is who I am. And throughout the day, we have to constantly connect with who we truly are. And these virtues is who we truly are. And constantly reminding ourselves that I am not anger. I am not the ego. I am not greed. But in fact, I am contentment. I am selflessness. I am humility. I am forgiveness. We have to connect with this positivity that already resides within our soul. And the more and more we do this, the more and more we become closer to our soul and experience that tremendous joy and fulfillment that already lies within our soul. <coughs> Unfortunately, right now we are constantly connecting with the external world. We are constantly connecting with the ego, which constantly makes us feel inadequate. The ego constantly makes us compare ourselves with others. The ego constantly makes us feel like we need more to be special. The ego constantly craves attention and appreciation and we are constantly connecting ourselves with this negativity and this ego and instead we are not connecting ourselves with our soul which is who we truly are and we as a soul are egoless. We don't need any of those things to feel fulfillment. In fact, the further we are from these cravings, the more fulfilled we feel within. Unfortunately, we think if I fill up my desires, will I feel fulfilled from within, will I feel complete? But that is nothing but a mere illusion. The more desires you fulfill, the more desires multiply within you and you will al always feel unfulfilled, you will always feel like incomplete, you will always feel the need for more and more. So you need to first of all detach yourself with the ego and for that you need to every day ask yourself, who am I? What is my nature? What is mine and what is not mine? I remember my guru gave, gave us a really beautiful practice to do every day or every morning or every night whenever you get like 5 or 10 minutes and just recite. This body is not mine. This house is not mine. Just say it. I mean, right now you register just at the intellectual level. It may not really register at the emotional level. But if we constantly repeat this mantra, this body is not mine. This house is not mine. This money is not mine. This family is not mine. This These clothes are not mine. Just think of five or six things to say. And you will find how over a period of time, you know, anything that happens externally won't affect you internally. You you rise about the situation. Jai Chale. Uh, I've heard about you uh, since just a week before and what your Diksha. And since then I've been like it's it has inspired me a lot. I'm from Mumbai, I have stayed here for three years. I'm planning to go back to India soon. So, uh, this, this may be my laziness or Pramad asking you this question, but uh, I've seen that we have a lot of Kriyas to do. Like, as a Sadhu, Sadhvi, there's a lot of Kriya, and also as a Shrava, Shravika, we go to a temple. There's a lot of, like, uh, set Kriyas. Sorry. Yeah, ritual. Yeah, ritual. So, uh, when I always keep on thinking that uh, if it's all about internal, or uh, like, you know, happiness and all about things within, why all these Kriyas, you know, why so much in yes. so that's, that's a good question. I think you asked the question that probably a lot of people have on their minds. So thank you for asking the question. Um, you know what? Uh, we don't really experience anything internal without external efforts. Like even if we want to feel full, which is an internal emotion, we need to take the external effort of putting food into our mouth. Similarly, these kriyas, if done in the right way with right understanding, by doing them, you will find that you are changing from within. Like for example, if you want to develop the quality of compassion within you, you need to do the external kriya of throwing away all your leather items and replacing them with non-leather items. That is also a kriya. It's 
an external action that is going to lead into internal growth. Similarly, all these kriyas that we are doing in the temple, they are nothing but external actions that result in internal growth. Like for example, bowing down in front of Bhagwan, taking a kamasamu, doing the kriya of simply just bowing down, you will notice over a period of time, your ego does reduce to the extent that you are accept. See, we always feel I am something, what I think is right, I mean, I come first before anyone, but by acknowledging that someone is better than me, subconsciously that is uh, hammering your ego and reducing your ego because only someone whose ego has reduced to even a little bit can actually do the physical act of bowing down to someone. So these kriyas all have a very significant purpose and they are, they are not religion in itself but they are the means towards uh, acquiring the virtues of the soul. And for that, we need to have the understanding behind each Kriya. And if we do it with that understanding, honestly, you will find that you will grow with, from within at a much more rapid pace than without reason Kriya. Like I said, even if you want to develop the quality of forgiveness, you need to, take, you need to have that external Kriya of actually, uh, you know, um, of actually saying it's okay, if, you know, when someone gets angry to you, but actually letting them know that it's okay, I forgive you, I'm not angry back to you. We need to speak those words to, to reinforce the quality of forgiveness within us. So to acquire any quality, we have to do some physical effort to, to strengthen that quality. It's just unfortunately that the knowledge of the sutras and the kriyas, therefore we find them meaningless. But once you acquire a little bit of knowledge, even you, you really have a lot of respect for these. My name is Nina, and um, I'm curious, this knowing that Jains travel around the world and recognizing the benefits of spiritual advisors, um, I'm curious what you think about the, if, if there's a viable possibility for some changes in, in sadhu and sadvi practice that would allow um, more acceptance of uh, travel or the use of technology. Um, I'm curious what you think about that and, and about some of the groups who are doing that um, and how you think it fits into the spectrum of, of Jane and sadhu. Can I ask that question? I thought that was something I did want to speak about. Um, so, once again, the whole point of taking diksha is to the upliftment of your own soul and simultaneously if other people benefit, that is something one would strive for, but the primary objective is to free yourself of all karma and all negativity. So, uh, you know, using transportation and electricity, uh, I'm not sure if you know how electricity is created, but one of the ways is where they have these huge turbines spinning really rapidly in oceans, which create electricity, and in the process, millions of fish and sea life are chopped up. So, for someone who has taken a vow of ahimsa, of promising, and for someone who believes that all souls are equal, all souls are my family, I will treat all souls as I want to be treated myself. And as I want, would want my say, children to be treated, that's how I would treat every soul, and that's the whole purpose of taking diksha. So that you can live a life of utmost compassion and utmost non-violence and utmost equanimity, where you're treating all souls equally. So someone who has taken diksha, if they start using electricity and start using modes of transportation, they in fact are, tr are increasing violence in their life at a very rapid pace and they are breaking their vow which they have taken in front of God and their Guru uh, during Diksha. So definitely someone who has taken Diksha for the upliftment and purification of their own soul will never use modes of transportation or use an electric you know, appliance like a phone or whatever. And that is completely against 
or completely against the purpose of taking diksha. I mean, if it, if you want to, if this is something you want to do, travel the world and you know try to spread the message, then don't take diksha. Do it and live the life of an ordinary person, but don't take diksha and break your vow. And and you know, people have taken diksha as a role model for others, and if they themselves start going against.